Hello and welcome to our 10th annual Owl Prof. Although the venue is a bit different this year, we still want to share our owls with you. And in this video, you'll get a chance to see our amazing owls and what would be their natural habitat. You will also learn about the special features that help them survive being the nocturnal hunters they are. We'll also show you a few signs to look for to see if you have owls in the woods behind your house. As this is one of our biggest fundraisers, we hope that if you enjoy this video, you'll think about making a donation to help feed our birds and to help heat our aviaries through the winter. Thank you. So, you've heard an owl in the woods behind your house. you're out in the woods and you're on an owl prowl. Some of the things you want to look for to find perhaps where that owl roosts at night are what you would see below here under a tree where perhaps an owl would sit eating its prey item and then about 8 to 12 hours after they eat they cast up a pellet fur, feathers and bones of what that bird has eaten and not been able to digest. Also, look for the whitewash, the mute, under a tree. Feathers, especially this time of year as everybody is molting. These are just a few of the things that you would look for while you are out on your owl prowl, or perhaps that walk in the woods. Hello, our next owl is quite often found in this type of habitat, a coniferous forest. Uh, Cone-bearing trees. This little bird likes to nest in these trees. Also, maybe in a hardwood tree where there's a, a nice hollowed out cavity for them. Their method of protecting themselves is actually called playing pine cone. And our next clue will be what this bird sounds like. So this is Keegan. She is our northern saw wet owl. The call she makes, people liken it to the sound of a saw being wetted or sharpened on a wedding stone. She is with us due to a wing injury. She was found in Columbia, Connecticut two years ago in a barn surrounded by barn caps. We don't know how she injured her wing, but the result is that one wing is a bit shorter than the other and she does not have silent flight something owls need to survive. This is as big as this little bird gets. We figured due to her size, she is a female. She's about 112 grams, or a little over three ounces, the size of one of your favorite candy bars, perhaps. They are on a special concern list here in Connecticut. It's thought that the cedar trees that this bird so often likes to nest in, they were wiped out due to disease, so that left less habitat for this bird. There are also many larger owls that this bird has to compete for territory and prey base with. One of her favorite foods is a red-backed vole. They've done a study now finding these birds will actually nest as far south as Pennsylvania and as far north as southern Canada. They're one of the few owl species that actually migrates it seems the female and the young do the majority of the migrating. The male perhaps stays back and takes care of the nesting area and the territory. They are a nomadic little bird. Many of our raptors mate for life. This little bird, however, she may be up in southern Canada one year and on her migration on the way back, perhaps in Vermont or Maine, she comes across a nice looking male sawwet who's got territory and perhaps some food to offer, and perhaps that's where this bird will stay and nest that year. One of the few owls that looks different as a juvenile, this little bird is this dark chocolate solid brown on its head and its back with sort of a yellowish colored chest and big vivid white eyebrows. As this bird starts to migrate when they're about six months old or so, this bird will lose that coloring, uh, molt out those feathers, 
and get the colors that you see today of the adult sawwet. Now because she's so little, as I mentioned before, this bird uses camouflage a lot to protect herself. And what she does is called plain pine cone. So she'll blend right in with the sun specks going through the pine tree. And what she does is she draws herself up very thin and narrow. Fulsil's third eyelids are nictitating membranes up over her eyes to cover the brightness. Maybe backs up against that tree trunk and then takes her wing and folds it up and over her face. So she looks just like a pine cone. She can look out of those feathers, but they are going to cover those big bright eyes that otherwise might expose her to predators. As I mentioned earlier, this little bird does not have silent flight. Owls need silent flight in order to hunt and survive. As they hunt with their sense of hearing, they fly low and close to the ground so they can hear their prey items. They are not fast flyers like your peregrine falcon. So if their prey item were to hear them on approach, that prey item might easily be able to outdistance or outrun these birds. Also, if you are flying and listening for your prey items and your wings make a lot of noise, that's going to drown out the sound of your prey item. What helps them with the silent flight adaptation is the leading edge of their flight feathers are serrated like the space between my fingers. The back edge are ruffled, so that helps the wind pass through those feathers soundlessly so they can sneak up on their prey items and have a successful hunt. Hi, Jeannie here again, and in a couple minutes we're going to be bringing out another type of owl for you. But a couple questions, well one question, what kind of owl do you think it might be? I'm standing here in the woods, there's some old growth trees, some big trees here. There's a lot of dead trees also around here, and this is a great habitat for them. They like to live in cavities, even nest boxes that you could put up in your backyard. So what kind of owl? And here's another clue for you. Another hint. This is what they sound like. That's one of many different kinds of sounds that these owls can make. Any guesses? So if anyone guessed an eastern screech owl, you were correct. And all three of these birds here that you're looking at are eastern screech owls. They come in different color forms. First one here is jade, then you have tansy, and then you have oakley. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about jade and why she's with us. So jade was found underneath someone's car in their driveway in Manchester several years ago. Presumably she was struck by a vehicle and she managed to crawl up the driveway, get herself to safety, and then a man came out, he was heading to work, and he saw this little bundle of feathers underneath his car and it was Jade. So what happened to her was we think she flew into a car because she was probably chasing a prey item and she's not looking at anything but that prey and flew right into the car and she struck the vehicle so hard that it actually resulted in her losing one of her eyes. Um, she probably has hearing damage as well and you've learned that all of these things are really important for these owls to survive in the wild. So that's why Jade now stays with us at Horizon Wings. And next to Jade is Tansy, our uh, sort of a brown form or chocolate color eastern screech owl. Like Jade, her injury is due to a motor vehicle collision. And she was found up here in the northeastern part of the state, rehabilitated by Horizon Wings, uh, sent to Maine to live with Hope from Windover Wings. But when she retired, Tansy came back to join us. And on my right hand is Oakley, the red form of Eastern Screech Owl. So we've got the gray, we've got the red, and we've got sort of the tweener here. And when a red and gray share a nest box, you may get this sort of chocolate colored bird, or you might get the distinctive red or the distinctive gray. Now Oakley's story is a little different. There wasn't a car collision. If Oakley would turn around, you would see that Oakley has two healthy eyes. She can fly. Her injury has to do with her mind. Her nest tree was cut down when she and her three siblings were very, very young. The gentleman who cut down the tree was very concerned and he called the Massachusetts Audubon where this little bird is from. 
the gentleman at the Audubon said, please bring the babies in. We will put them back out in the wild with foster parents so they can grow up in the wild and learn who and what they are. And the homeowner told the gentleman, oh, no worries, I'll get that done for you. Well, she did, but she waited about eight weeks to do it. And during that time, she hand fed those four baby owlets. The children got to play with them. Their friends got to play with them. These animals got used to cats and dogs and being handled and talked to by people. So during that very important period of time in their life, when they should have been learning to be owls, they learned to be people instead. And it made them totally non-releasable. After about two months, the woman took them to the Audubon, probably getting too much to feed four young owls. And she walked in and the gentleman said, I see three red ones and you told me the fourth was a gray. Where's the gray one? And she said, oh, I'm so sorry that little bird died. And her child piped up and said, well, mommy, what about the gray one we left at home? Mommy grabbed daughter and hurriedly left Audubon, leaving these three little red screech owls behind. They have all since been placed around New England as educational ambassadors. It's sort of a shame as we seem to think these owls are on decline here in uh, southern New England. I know myself um, and some other rehabilitation places have not seen as many screech owls as we have in the past years. Even Tufts University has not seen them. There's been no formal studies, but it seems like uh, bird counts and such around the state are definitely seeing less of them. So without a formal study, we don't know hows or whys of this, but we are definitely seeing less of them. This is a habitat they like, uh, deciduous forest. They will nest in cavities, old trees that maybe a woodpecker hollowed out. They are pretty opportunistic. They will eat just about anything that presents itself. They'll take a salamander, maybe a little fish or crayfish. They'll take other small birds. They'll take rodents. So they are very opportunistic hunters. Hunters that come out the first four hours after dusk usually. That is when you see or hear these birds. Jeannie played one call for you. These birds have the largest variety of calls of any of your owls, and that was just the one, the whinny sound, that is a, a very common noise that they make. Things that may prey upon these birds are other larger owls, larger raptors, um, small birds, cats, dogs. So being a smaller bird, they might only live four to seven years in the wild, although one was documented of being 15 years old. Other things that might impact these birds are our chimneys. They are cavity dwellers, so they like nice dark spaces to make their nest. And that includes chimneys. These little birds might go down inside a chimney. Hopefully the flue is shut. They're not going to uh, fall into any cinders or burning embers. But what happens if they get stuck in a chimney? They may struggle. It may cause eye damage or head damage, uh, feather damage. So what you want to do to keep these little owls and other wildlife safe, we've even pulled ducks, barred owls, raccoons out of chimneys. Put a cap over your chimney. It'll keep these birds safe. It'll keep them out of your chimney. So you won't have to be calling Horizon Wings or anyone else for a rescue for these little birds. They are a tufted owl. You can see the feathers on their head. And again, those are not their ears. Their ears are on either side of their head behind that facial disc. While some people say they do have asymmetrical hearing, one ear above the other, it certainly isn't as pronounced as, say, your sawwet or your barn owl. And when I turn Oakley around, you might be able to see the back of those feathers are a little concave. So that might even help to draw sound into that facial disc. Very important for these birds so they can hunt. So we've talked about features of owls. They're amazing features, what helps them to be the phenomenal uh, nocturnal or nighttime hunters they are. And with these little birds, we're gonna talk about their eyes. If you had eyes as large as an owl, they'd be like giant oranges in your face. So for that reason, there's not room for muscles. So that enables us as humans, we have those muscles, we can look up and down, side to side. But these birds can't do that. Their eyes are fixed like headlights in your car. So they need to be able to turn their head to have that full range of vision. 
This little bird's eyes are so large, they actually make up one-fifth of its body weight. So they have to turn their head in order to have a full range of vision like you and I. So how many people out there think an owl can turn its head all the way around? I know it looks like it sometimes because they are so agile and they do it so fast, but indeed they can only turn it about 270 degrees or three quarters of the way around. But again, they do it so fast, some people think they can turn it 360 or all the way around. Now, what enables them to do that is a very flexible, bendable neck. You and I, as mammals, have seven vertebrae in our neck. Even that big giraffe has seven, and that little tiny mouse has seven because they're mammals. But most birds, including your owls, have 14 vertebrae in their neck, which gives them that flexibility to be able to move their head and have that full range of vision. What kind of owl do you think lives here in this habitat? Barns, silos, pastures, open fields. Here's another clue for you. This is what this owl sounds like. So what do you think? So this is Titan. Titan is a barn owl. He's originally from Utah. He was found by the side of the road with an injury to his coracoid, kind of like our collarbone. It had already started to heal. So he was not, he does not have good mobility with one of his wings, and that's why he stays with us at Horizon Wings. Barn owls are distinguished by that beautiful heart-shaped face. They have a cinnamon and spotted top to their body, and their bellies are white. There's a difference between the males and the females. The males have just a few small black spots on their belly. The females have more. The other difference is the females are usually about a third bigger than the males. Titan is about a pound. He's considered a medium-sized owl. The female would weigh a bit more. These owls are found on every continent except Antarctica. Here in the United States, we have them in all 48 of the lower states, and they actually range up into southern Canada. They like farmlands, open fields, where they can hunt. Here in Connecticut, we've never had a lot of them, but they are currently on our endangered species list. That's because we have taken up a lot of our farmland and used it for development and also because of our use of insecticides and rodenticides. Rodenticides are poisons we put out for mice, easy for us to use, but unfortunately, when the mice eat those poisons, it takes them 10 days to die. During that time, they're weak and they're looking for water, which makes them easy prey for birds like Titan and all of our raptors. One poison mouse could kill a bird like Titan or if he were to bring it back to his family, it could actually kill all of his babies. So being an owl, this bird has some amazing adaptations to hunt at night. Barn owls have the best hearing of any animal ever tested. And their ears are different than ours. They're asymmetrical. One ear sits up higher on their head and is longer. The other ear sits lower and is shorter. This means that they can triangulate sound. So when they hear a rustling by moving their head from side to side, when they can hear that rustling the same in both ears, it means that they have a beeline to that mouse or that bowl. They like to sit on perches and scan fields looking for their prey. Then they swoop down with really slow wing beats and they go to pick up their prey, whether it's a mouse, a vole, or even a chipmunk. They've even been known to take some small birds like blackbirds. These birds are such good hunters that one family can eat a thousand rodents in a season. 
that means that they are a farmer's friend. As a matter of fact, some farms in California are putting up barn owl boxes instead of using rodenticides. It's a win-win situation, better for the environment and better for our raptors. These birds have large families. Barn owls can lay from one to 16 eggs twice a year. That's a lot of eggs. The male does most of the hunting while the female sits and takes care of the eggs and the young. And when the babies get bigger, the male actually has to help because there's too many mouths to feed. These birds do migrate. Uh, some stay in their northern territories, but the ones that are in New England may migrate all the way down into southeast United States and Texas. Those that live in the Carolinas southwards stay where they are. They do not need to migrate in the winter because they have a good food supply where they live. And that is Titan, our barn owl. standing in a brook today. Well, that's for a reason, because our next owl that you're going to meet likes to be in many different habitats. One of them is a brook. It could be near a pond, near a swamp, or in the woods. You might even find one in your backyard. Anybody know what kind of owl we're talking about today? Here's one more clue. This is what the next owl sounds like. Now does anybody know? So if anybody gets barred owl, you're correct. This is Asha. Asha is our educational barred owl that came to Horizon Wings about two and a half years ago. Asha was found in the road where she was struck by a vehicle and she suffered a severe head injury that resulted in the loss of one of her eyes. She also has some hearing loss as well and for both of these reasons that's why she now stays with us at Horizon Wings. Now she's called a barred owl for the barring that's on her chest here. And these owls are very common in our state and I did the call for you a second ago. It's the who, who, who cooks for you all. That's just one of the calls that these owls can make. There's a variety of ones, and they can actually sound like monkeys chattering or dogs barking even in your backyard. So you can hear a blue jay calling in the background here maybe. That's because blue jays will harass these birds and let you know that there's an owl or a bird of prey nearby. So if you're walking in the woods, that's one of the signs to listen for. So Asha here, as I said, I'm standing in the middle of a brook today. And barred owls, believe it or not, love to be near a body of water. So you're going to find them in the woods like we're in today. It's pretty deep woods, but there's water nearby, and that's what they really like. So they're going to have a swamp, a pond, or a brook nearby. And that's because of some things that they like to hunt in this body of water. First one, maybe, a crayfish. The brook that we're in today is perfect for crayfish. And if barn owls eat a lot of crayfish, it's kind of neat. You spread their wings open, there's a pink tinge underneath their wings, and you can tell they've been eating a lot of crayfish. They might eat some snails, they might eat snakes that are near the water, but something, or frogs, lots and lots of frogs and tadpoles they eat. But one of their other favorite things that they like to eat is fish if they're near a body of water. And they don't just go in the water and walk around and get them, they'll actually fly over a body of water like you could imagine an eagle doing, and they can grab a fish out of the water. But barred owls don't only eat those things, they eat a variety of other things, including other birds, maybe large insects, maybe even some earthworms if they're young barred owls, but they're going to eat a lot of rodents, including mice and voles and even small chipmunks. So they eat a lot of different things for us out there. So some places, like I said, you might find these barred owls are in the deep woods. Look for a body of water, <clears throat> including a pond or a swamp. But you might have them in your backyard as well. So in our backyard, we have a swamp back there. So we've put up a barred owl box 
hoping to attract these birds. We can hear them hooting off around in the woods behind us, and we're hoping to attract them to nest right in the barn owl box right in our backyard. You can also do the same if you have the right habitat. One of the dangers for these birds that are out there because they're near bodies of water so much is fishing line. Fishing line is very, very dangerous to our wildlife. Um, we actually had a barred owl come in that was wrapped up in fishing line. So if you're a fisher person out there, please try to get your line if you get hooked up. Or if you're out hiking in the woods, look for fishing line and pick it up for us and help our wildlife. So again, this is Asha, the barred owl. So this habitat is a habitat where our next bird is quite often found. Deep in the woods, hardwood forests mixed with pine groves here and there. Uh, water around, an ample water supply, brooks, etc. So our next bird is the largest owl that we have here in Connecticut. And perhaps this sound will give you a clue, the true hoot owl. <coughs> That last sound is the sound that the young makes and calling for their parents. When the parents uh, start chasing them off, when the young are fledging, they're learning to fly, they want to communicate with their parents, they want to be fed. That's the sound of our next bird. This is Oscar. He's our great horned owl, called the great horn for those feather tufts on his head. They are known as a tiger of the woods. And Oscar came to us about 12 years ago when he was hit by a garbage truck down in the southern part of Connecticut. It was dark out and the gentlemen heard a thunk and they didn't stop but instead drove up to Hartford where they heard another thunk when they opened the door and that was Oscar. He was wedged between the side view mirror and the door and they did not notice him. The result of that was he crushed his shoulder and is now not a flighted bird. And that is why Oscar stays with us. Great horned owls, as I said, they are known as a tiger of the woods and it's not just their coloration, but their personality, their strength. Those talons can put almost as much pressure as a bald eagle on something, about 400 PSI. And they're not afraid of much. They nest very early in the year in habitat like this, hardwood forest, where there's a mix of hardwood forest and pine trees, and they don't make their own nest. They nest early enough in the year, and they are big enough and strong enough, they are big enough and strong enough that they can take whichever nest they choose, including sometimes chasing bald eagles out of their nests and their territory. They're Prey base is pretty much anything they want, from something as small as a vole or a mouse to something as large as a rabbit. Or sometimes they will go after flocks of turkeys, eating nothing but the head. The brain supplies a lot of protein and a lot of fat for these birds. They're one of the few animals that can actually successfully catch a porcupine. And one of their favorite things to eat is skunk. Birds of prey, owls, have little to no sense of smell compared to us, so all they know is that a skunk moves very slow, doesn't see well, and is easy to catch. While most birds of prey can only lift 30 to 50 percent of their body weight, Oscar being a male here weighs a little under four pounds. Females can go up birds of five with a five foot wingspan. They can actually pick up something twice their body weight, something as large as a skunk or a small dog, or a house cat even. And they can carry it off, not long distances, maybe perhaps up onto your roof or into a tree, but that is how powerful the great horned owl is. Oscar played an important role for us this year. We received two young great horned owls that had been too injured to return to their nest. Oscar acted as a foster parent he taught them how to communicate and how to tear up their prey items. So at the end of the season, these birds knew who and what they were and will have a more successful chance in the wild than if they had been raised by humans.
So I was saying that these birds had strength almost equal to that of the bald eagle. And it's because of their special feet. They have what's called zygodactyl toes. So they can have three in front and one in back if they choose. But when they go to grab their prey items, or maybe grip a perch, because owls like to sleep on their bellies, to get that better grip, they take that outside toe and they turn it around so they have two in front and two in back. And that enhances an owl's grip. Again, making this bird half the size of a bald eagle almost as strong as one.